that would shoot big colored rocks into a very low orbit, giving Earth the same sort of rings that Saturn has. I still think this would be a fine idea, but it turns out that building a cannon that can shoot boulders into a low orbit is fairly complicated. I'd been in this park so many times before that it was mapped in my mind, so we were only a few steps inside when I began to sense that the world was out of order, even though I couldn't immediately figure out what was different. Quentin, Margot said, quietly, calmly. She was pointing, and then I realized what was different. There was a live oak a few feet ahead of us, thick and gnarled and ancient-looking. That was not new. The playground on our right, not new either. But now a guy wearing a gray suit slumped against the trunk of the oak tree, not moving. This was new. He was encircled by blood. A half-dried fountain of it poured out of his mouth, the mouth open in a way that mouths generally shouldn't be, flies at rest on his pale forehead. He's dead, Margot said, as if I couldn't tell. I took two small steps backward. I remember thinking that if I made any sudden movements, he might wake up and attack me. Maybe he was a zombie. I knew zombies weren't real, but he sure looked like a potential zombie. As I took those two steps back, Margot took two equally small and quiet steps forward. His eyes are open, she said. We gotta go home, I said. I thought you closed your eyes when you died, she said. Margot, we gotta go home and tell. She took another step. She was close enough now to reach out and touch his foot. What do you think happened to him? She asked. Maybe it was drugs or something. I didn't want to leave Margo alone with the dead guy who might be an attack zombie, but I also didn't care to stand around and chat about the circumstances of his demise. I gathered my courage and stepped forward to take her hand. Margo, we gotta go right now. Okay, yeah she said. We ran to our bikes, my stomach churning with something that felt exactly like excitement, but wasn't. We got on our bikes and I let her go in front of me because I was crying and didn't want her to see. I could see blood on the soles of her purple sneakers, his blood, the dead guy blood. And then we were back home in our separate houses. My parents called 911 and I heard the sirens in the distance and asked to see the fire trucks, but my mom said no. Then I took a nap. Both my parents are therapists, which means that I am really goddamned well-adjusted. So when I woke up, I had a long conversation with my mom about the cycle of life and how death is part of life, but not a part of life I needed to be particularly concerned about at the age of nine, and I felt better. Honestly, I never worried about it much, which is saying something, because I can do some worrying. Here's the thing. I found a dead guy, little adorable nine-year-old me, and my even littler and more adorable playdate found a guy with blood pouring out of his mouth, and that blood was on her little adorable sneakers as we biked home. It's all very dramatic and everything, but so what? I didn't know the guy. People I don't know die all the damn time. If I had a nervous breakdown every time something awful happened in the world, I'd be crazier than a shithouse rat. That night, I went into my room at nine o'clock to go to bed, because nine o'clock was my bedtime. My mom tucked me in, told me she loved me, and I said, See you tomorrow. And she said, See you tomorrow. And then she turned out the lights and closed the door almost all the way. As I turned on my side, I saw Margot Roth Spiegelman standing outside my window, her face almost pressed against the screen. I got up and opened the window, but the screen stayed between us pixelating her. I did an investigation, she said quite seriously. Even up close, the screen broke her face apart, but I could tell that she was holding a little notebook and a pencil with teeth marks around the eraser. She glanced down at her notes. Mrs. Feldman from over on Jefferson Court said his name was Robert Joyner. She told me he lived on Jefferson Road in one of those condos on top of the grocery store. So I went over there, and there were a bunch of policemen, and one of them asked if I worked at the school paper, and I said our school didn't have a paper, and he said as long as I wasn't a journalist, he would answer my questions. He said Robert Joyner was 36 years old, a lawyer. They wouldn't let me in the apartment, but a lady named Juanita Alvarez lives next door to him.